We've been in a series entitled Finding Joy um, based on the book of Philippians. And tonight where we're going to be is we're going to be at the end of chapter number one and at the beginning of chapter number two. And so before we begin, I just want to remind you, and I know that most of you know this, but sometimes we don't always consider it when we're reading through a, a passage, is that your Bible was, had chapters and verses added later to kind of help people find them. And so most of the time, the way that I kind of try to break down a book is almost, the way, especially an epistle that Paul wrote, um, or really anyone wrote, is that you can almost break them down by kind of like a letter, kind of like a paragraph. And so as you read through this, um, what I've tried to do is say, okay, this is what I feel like would have been a paragraph. This is what I feel like would have been a paragraph. And so this is what we're going to be uh, doing for tonight. And so don't pay as much attention to the, or to the chapters and verses as much as you do the thought and that that is all together. This is really a part one of a two-part lesson that will continue next week uh, over the next couple of verses. But I want to just remind you, before we dive into it, this passage is that the last couple of weeks, the last couple of lessons, as we've talked about finding joy, one of the things that we have seen is that finding joy is often attached to God's will for your life. That was really the whole theme of last week was that God's will is what brings joy into your life. When you can find God's will and do it, sometimes that is God's specific will. Sometimes it's just his general will. Sometimes you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do, but you know there are some things that God wants you to be doing. And so that's really what we're going to look at tonight is going to be a continuation of that thought. So let's read Philippians chapter number 1. Verse number 27, and we'll read down through chapter number 2 and verse 4. Verse number 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. I want you to take a special note of that word becometh, all right? Becometh. That whether I come and see you or else be present or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. Verse number 1 of chapter 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I want you to go back up and look at verse number 27. Let's read that together again. Uh, you don't have to read it out loud, but I just want you to pay attention to it. It says in verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then skip down and look at verse number 3 of chapter 2, where it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us as we look at these verses tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for once again the opportunity you've given us to look into your word. Lord, I pray that tonight the, the Holy Spirit would uh, just really invade our hearts and our lives. And Lord, that you would show us how we can take this and we can apply it. Lord, how we can live differently and change as a result of what we've heard from your word tonight. pray that you would give me the words to say. Lord, I pray that you would help me uh, to say only that which you would have me to. Lord, I pray that you would help me to stay on topic. Lord, help me to stay focused on the message at hand. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, I want you to do a little exercise with me for just a moment before we begin. I want you to think back on some of the most unjoyful or unpleasant times in your life. Now, don't think about them too long or too hard because I don't want you to go into a state of discouragement or depression right here in the midst of class. But think about some of the most unjoyful and unpleasant times of your life, okay? How many of those 
were the direct result of a loss of unity with someone around you? How many of those were the direct result of a loss of unity from someone around you? Now, when I say a loss of unity, here's what I'm basically saying. How many of the most unjoyful situations and unpleasant times in your life were the cause of maybe your relationship with someone else? Were the cause of maybe something that someone else did? Something that someone else said? Something that someone else, some, uh, how someone made you feel? Maybe how someone hurt you, or maybe how someone didn't give you the attention that you thought you deserved. If we're honest, most of the unjoyful and unpleasant situations that occur in our lives are the result of someone else influencing how we feel. That's just human nature, unfortunately. And so what we need to recognize tonight is that a loss of unity or the lack of unity is one of the greatest thieves of joy that you can experience in the human life. When you have to deal with maybe a loss of connection with a friend, with a family member, with a coworker, and we're specifically talking about Christians tonight. We're specifically talking about your relationship with those who are really the same as you, who you'll spend eternity with. And that happens. That's going to happen. That's going to happen just because you're a human being. Totally take the Christianity side of it out. That is going to happen because you are a human being. But as a child of God, I want you to notice that while that is just purely a fact of life, that you're going to experience a loss of unity, that you're going to have relationships, that you're going to have connections, that you're going to have friendships that hurt you, here's what I want you to see is that unity can be restored and that your unity is one of the greatest sources of your Christian joy when handled the way that Jesus Christ wants you to handle it. So with that in mind, I want us to look tonight at three different actions for maintaining Christian unity. In our text, Paul continues with the thought of Christian joy, but in this, in this part, rather than focusing on the purpose of God for you individually, he focuses on the purpose of God for us collectively. He wants us to see what, how, does the, how does Christian joy look in the context of life as a church or as a group of Christians. And as we learned last week, if Christian joy is found in fulfilling God's purpose for your life, then the loss of unity is a thief of Christian joy. Then it is safe to assume that Christian unity is also found when fulfilling that purpose. So the first thing that I want you to notice tonight is that we must align ourselves or align yourself with what matters most. Align yourself with what matters. I want you to look at verse number 27. It says this, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. It is very easy to assume that when you live inside the box, when you're just focused on yourself, well, yeah, I have aligned myself with what matters. That's very easy to assume, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing what matters. I, I'm living my life the way that God wants me to. And here's what Paul is really trying to refocus them on, is that, yes, you might be doing what God has called you to do, but are you doing something for the greater cause of Jesus Christ? And just like we talked about last week, that the way that you find joy in fulfilling God's purpose for your life is by taking your eyes off of what you want and placing them on what God wants. The same way that you do that as an individual is what you are called to do to maintain Christian unity as a group and as a church and as a class. And the moment that we take our eyes off of the purpose of God, which is reaching the world, okay, the Great Commission, the moment that we take our eyes off of that and place them on our individual needs, guess what? That doesn't just rob you of joy, that robs the group, the church, the ecclesia, the whatever you want to refer to Christianity as, that robs us of Christian unity. And here's why. 
Because rather than aligning your life with what matters, you've now aligned your life with what matters to you. And if you are purely focused in this life off of, well, what, this is what I need. This is, this is what I can get out of the church. This is what I need from other Christians. I want you to see this. Number one, you will have a hard time finding joy in Jesus Christ. Number two, you will have a hard time staying in unity with those around you. Because you'll be focused on what you need more than what God wants you to do as a group and as a team. So align yourself with what matters. You say, okay, well, how can I know if I've done that? I've found that one of the best ways to really evaluate yourself in the Christian life is just to ask yourself questions from Scripture. I can make a lot of statements, but I've said this often in here, that statements condemn, questions convict. If I make a statement, you can kind of say, yeah, that's probably for that person over there. But only you and the Holy Spirit can answer the question, okay? So I want you to go down through this passage, these two verses with me, and answer these questions and ask yourself, okay, am I aligned with what matters most? First of all, the first question is, what does your life say about the gospel? What does your life say about the gospel? I told you when we were reading through to take special note of that word, becometh. That word in your English Bible is a word that we would probably say, well, that means that they're becoming. That means that it's attractive. When you say that someone's becoming, which probably most of us don't use that word in our day-to-day lives, okay? Unless you're from Great Britain or somewhere. But when you say that someone is becoming, it means that there's something attractive about them. In this verse, it is translated, obviously, in your English Bible as the word becometh. But it's translated elsewhere in your King James English Bible as walk worthy. Or in 3 John, it is translated to walk after a godly sort. And here's what he's saying. Is that the way that you live your life matters. The way that you interact with those around you matters. And it better be said of the Christians in this room and the Christians of Franklin Road Baptist Church that we make the gospel look attractive. That we are walking in a way to where people would say there is something different about them. They're walking after a godly sort. Unfortunately for most Christians, the way that they live their life actually gives someone an excuse for why they don't want to believe in Christianity. Well, that person was hypocritical, or that person didn't treat me the way that I thought that they should treat me, or I know enough about the Bible to know that that's not the way that God would want that have handled. And that's a hard place to put yourself in, but the truth is is that your life is the greatest reflection of the gospel out there. You can witness, you can share a track, you can, you can do all of the right things in how you share the gospel and evangelize, but if your life does not match up with what you are telling other people to believe, then I can promise you this, that you will have a hard time having an impact on those around you. So what does your life say about the gospel? You say, okay, well, I don't really know how to gauge that. That's kind of vague. Let's keep moving. What do others say about you? What do others say about you? Now, let me just be quick to say this, okay? When I ask you the question, what do others say about you, I'm not talking about what do others gossip about you, okay? Because that's probably not a very good gauge. But when when I ask you the question, what do others say about you, here's what I'm asking. Is there anything in your life that others would have seen stand out, that they would say that is not a good representation of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the things that are true. Once again, I'm not talking about something that someone's made up or that they've developed in their own mind. I'm talking about if we went to your coworkers at work and we asked them, hey, this person is a Christian, they're a part of our church, how do they live their life? Would they, oh, I didn't know they were a Christian. If we went to maybe your family members and said, how's so-and-so doing with their walk with God? You know, I don't think they're doing very good. What's so-and-so watching on TV? What, what, What are their conversations about? What is their focus about? What do other people have to say about you? Would it be that you have integrity? Would it be that you have character in how you live your life? Would it be that you're pure in your conversations and in your relationships? Some of the stuff that Christians have been called to do since the beginning of time is starting to almost become 
public practice for most companies now, okay? Christians were taught the importance of character and integrity long before there was ever a policy manual for where you go to work. Christians were taught to remain sexually pure long before there was ever any sexual misconduct training, okay? And you better make sure that as a Christian, if you're wanting to align yourself with what matters most, that your lifestyle and what other people have to say about you that is true, that what other people say about you matches up with the Bible and the God that you say that you believe. Third question. Not only is what, do, what does your life say about the gospel, what do others say about you, but I want to ask you this, and then we'll expound on it a little bit. How is your spirit? How is your spirit? He says in verse number 27, that he says, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit. I want you to notice that that word spirit has a little s, okay? The definition of the word spirit that is used here in your Bible is referred to as this, the spirit, the vital principle by which the body is animated, the rational spirit, the power by which the human being feels, thinks, decides the soul. To put it plainly, this is who you are as a human being. This is what makes you up. What is your spirit? Daniel, if you refer back to the book of Daniel when he was taken into captivity, someone talked to me, what, was he, what made him stand out in the kingdom? There's two words used in your Bible. Un- Great, good answer, good job. Anybody? An excellent spirit. Not the Holy Spirit living inside him. I want you to watch this, okay? He stood out because of who he was. Because he had an excellent spirit. What are you known for as a child of God? You see, some of us, we are known for our spirit of fear rather than our spirit of hope. Okay, what's the Bible say? It says God hath not given us a spirit of fear, right? So if we're known for our spirit of fear, if our spirit of dread, more than our spirit for hope, then let me ask you, have you let God change that in your heart and in your life? Some of us are known for our spirit of negativity more than our spirit of positivity. Okay, and I'm not talking about like, a t-shirt that says positive vibes only and like a little peace sign or something. I'm talking about, seriously, we see the world through a negative light. I don't think that's the way that Jesus Christ intended it. I think that he intended those that know where they're headed, those that know that God is in control, those that know that Jesus can take care of them and that he saved them and that they're not on their way to hell. I think that he intended for us to maybe be positive and hopeful about what was going on. Do we agree with everything in the world? Absolutely not. Do we know what's going on in the world? Absolutely not. Especially the last six months, right? Seven months. We're into seven months now, okay? Feels like it's been seven years, doesn't it? We have no clue what's going on. But as a child of God, as a Christian, as someone who's supposed to be marked by joy, then our spirit, our attitude, who we are, should begin to pervade as Jesus Christ would. We should begin to act like Him. We should begin to interact with him, like Him. We should be hopeful. We should be joyful. We shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't be gloom and doom and dreadful. We should be looking forward to what God is going to do next. So how is your spirit? Now before we move on to the next question, I want to I show you this. Before you respond to the question, how is your spirit? Well, that's just who I am. I'm just naturally a... I just naturally see the dark side. I'm just naturally someone who worries about what's next. I'm just naturally the type of person that, whatever, you fill in the blank. That's just who I am. I want you to listen to this, and I'm not trying to be cruel. I just want you to see how that works out and plays out biblically. When we make the statement, well, that's just who I am, What we're saying is that our personality, our spirit, little s, is more powerful than the Holy Spirit, capital S. 
What if Paul would have said that? Well, you know, I know I met Jesus on the road to Damascus, but I'm just a murderer. That's just who I am. Do you think that God would have said, you know what, that's the guy that I want to write half of the, over half of the New Testament? No, instead he said, I'm going to change him from the inside out. And that's why by the time you get, read the book of Galatians that Paul is saying that you should bear fruit. That you should be known by being loving and joyful and long-suffering and gentle and kind. That's a murderer speaking, okay? That's just who I am doesn't work in the case of Paul. What about David? Once again, a murderer. An adulterer. And yet you read the book of Psalms and you see how God breaks his heart. You see in Psalm 51 how he says what we've quoted throughout this book, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Well, that's just who I am, God. When we say that, we're saying that who we are, our personality, our attitude, our sinful soul, is more powerful than the Holy Spirit that has come to live within us when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So guess what? If you're critical and unjoyful and gloom and doom, that can be replaced by joy and hope and peace that comes directly from God. If you say, well, I'm just someone who's, I'm fearful, I'm a worrier, that's just who I am, that can be placed by hope and replaced by hope and trust that comes directly from God. And here's why that is so important is because your spirit will eventually begin to influence you, which leads me to the next question, is what is on your mind? He says that he wants them to be of one spirit. But then he says he wants them to be of one mind. So what's on your mind? What do you spend your days thinking about? Chances are, that what is on your mind started in who you were, in your spirit. If you're fearful, if that's just your nature, if that's your makeup, if you're an anxious person, then eventually that anxiety is going to work its way into your mind. And guess what? You're going to spend your day thinking about about who you are. And you're not going to have the mind of Christ, which we'll talk about next week. You're not going to have the spirit of unity that is required to bring joy. You're not going to have certain things in the Christian life because you've allowed your personality, your little S spirit, to overrule God's capital S spirit, and now it's beginning to influence your mind. But watch this. If you are soaking your soul and your spirit in the Word of God, if you're learning more about who He is than who you are, that will begin to influence your mind. And unfortunately for us, I don't know that the application in this room is necessarily that you're, the people in here are worriers or that there's people in here that are anxious, and I'm, I'm sure that is. But unfortunately for most Christians, it's not that we dwell on bad things. It's that we dwell, to go back to the point, on things that do not matter. Most of you, I can probably describe your day to you right now. You woke up. Oh, man. I got to get some coffee. I got I to gotta get to work. I got to get here. I got I, I to do this. Some of you are like, I got to sleep in, sweet, I got to roll over, okay? Roll to the other side of the pillow. But for most of us, our day started off with, well, this is what's next. And then we got to work and we did a couple of jobs. We maybe did an online class. And then, well, about lunchtime, what am I hungry for? Hmm. Well, all right, let's pray, let's ask God, let's thank God for lunch. All right, well, I guess now I guess I get off at 4, I get off at 5, so can't wait for that to happen. I'll try to knock out two or three more things, get home, maybe watch some TV, eat some supper. Well, it's time for church. And for some of you, 
when we opened Philippians chapter number 1, it's the first time you thought about God today. And we wonder why we can't find heavenly joy on this earth. Some of you, and here's just the sad truth about our human makeup, and this is me included. Some of you, you woke up and you read something out of your Bible, and guess what? It helped you, it influenced you. Maybe you read something out of the book of Psalms. For me lately, the book of Psalms has just been raking me over the coals. And there's stuff that I read and I highlight and I underline, and I think, man, that is good. And guess what? The day starts and I'm done. And I never think about what God was trying to teach me about who he was. So how's your spirit? Because eventually your spirit will begin to influence what's on your mind. And if Paul wants us to be of one spirit and of one mind, then guess what? He probably doesn't want us thinking about what we're going to have for lunch. Hey, guess what? It's 1145. I bet everyone in Crosspoint is of one spirit and of one mind because they're all hungry. That's not what he's wanting, okay? When he says of one spirit and of one mind, it means that he wants us to be focused on what matters because here's what I want you to see, that eventually who you are will influence what's on your mind and eventually what's on your mind will influence what you do, which leads us to our next question is what are you striving for? What are you striving for? He says that if we're of one spirit and of one mind, then our actions will catch up and we should be striving for the faith of the gospel. You want something to think about tomorrow? You want something to be to build inside of you and change who you are? Wake up tomorrow and think about all of the people in this world that have yet to hear the gospel. Wake up tomorrow and think about the blessings that God has given you. Wake up tomorrow and think about where you would be if it were not for Jesus Christ who saved you. Do you think that that's the one spirit and the one mind that he was maybe going for? And that if he wants us to maintain unity because he knows that it can bring joy to us, then I want you to listen to this. Then chances are one of the best ways to maintain unity amongst Christians and in churches is to say, we're all just worried about seeing more people accept Jesus Christ. Yet for most of us, we have aligned our lives more with what doesn't matter then what does? And you say, well, how can I know? That leads us to our last question. One of the greatest things that you can do to evaluate this is look at the, look at the last, uh, or verse number 28. He says, he says in verse number 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. So let me ask you this. What are you scared of? Last week I asked you the question, what are the things that made you anxious this week? Chances are those are the things that you have made important. What works you up is what you have prioritized. But another way to ask that from this text is what are you scared of? Some of you, you're scared of not getting a job when you get out of college. That, that's something to worry about, okay? Some of you, you're scared of, what if I never meet the perfect one? Something to worry about, okay? Some of you are scared about, well, what if I made the wrong choice here? Or what if I don't do this? Or well, what if I don't have enough money to retire on? Join the club, okay? What if I did this wrong? What, whatever, okay? You can second guess all of those things. But in this, he doesn't say to worry about the things of this life. He says, don't be terrified of your adversaries. People that are going to fight against you. People that are going to fight against Jesus and the gospel. People that are going to fight against what you believe. So how do you do that? I want you to look at this, okay? How many of you, 
when you read through the script, you read through the Bible or you read a passage or whatever, you see a phrase and you're like, yeah, no clue what that means. <laughs> Next verse, right? <laughs> Didn't get that. <laughs> Let's turn the page and see what God has in the next one, right? Sometimes we can read a verse like number 29 and we're like, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Like, yeah, I am not supposed to be scared. Woo! Like, let's take on hell with a squirt gun. And then you read and it's like, which is to them an evident token of perdition. You're like, mm. yeah, <laughs> those guys, yeah, bad guys, right? Can I just encourage you with something? Okay. God doesn't give out certificates in heaven for how much of the Bible you read. All right. Like, oh, and now welcoming to heaven, Joel Norris. All right. He read through his Bible 57 times in his life. Let's welcome him. Here is the crown of Bible reading. Okay. It's okay to stop and say, I don't know what that means, but it's probably important, so I need to figure it out. And just to kind of give you an out, I'm the guy up here teaching, and I got to that, and I was like, whoa, evident token of perdition. Don't have that phrase underlined. But if it's in the Bible, it's there for a reason, right? Like, we, we like to sing all the songs, like, every promise in the book is mine. It's like, until I get to verse 9 that I don't know what it means, should be the rest of the song, right? stop, take a minute, and learn something. So when he says, and in nothing be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. An evident token means that it is a visible sign, okay? I'm not talking about Chuck E. Cheese tokens right here. It's a visible sign. So he says, when you are scared or when you're terrified of someone who's working against you, of someone who's fighting your mission, which is the gospel. He says, when that is visible to them, that it is an evident token or a visible sign of perdition. Okay? Perdition, we, it's used several times in the New Testament. Okay? Perdition is the word destruction or damnation. Okay? So here's what he's basically saying. When people see you scared of how they're treating you or scared of how they're acting, I believe that this passage is talking about unsaved, how unsaved people treat saved people. Okay, That's what I believe. I'm sure we could debate on it or whatever. That's just my personal belief. He says that they see it as a sign of, Haha, look, you're not, what, you're not what you thought you were. You're just on your way to hell like the rest of us because if you were actually saved, you wouldn't be scared. He says that's what it is to them. But I want you to look at the rest of the words in this verse. He says it's an evident sign of perdition to them, but to you of salvation and that of God. So here's what he says. When you're facing a hard time, when you're facing some difficulty from maybe someone else, mainly lost people, to them that's a sign that yeah, you're not as good as what you thought you were. You always said, God is in control. I trust God. God saved me. He's got a plan for my life. Well, what about now? To them, that's a sign that you're not who you say you were. But to you, and I want you to listen to this, it should be a sign of salvation that comes from God. And what he's trying to get us to recognize is that what the lost people say about you. And by the way, I firmly believe that what we are headed to as a world and as a country is that Christianity as a faith and as a belief system and as a religion, if you want to call it that, is getting ready to be met with resistance. Some of you have already experienced that on college campuses and in your workplace. And some of you will continue to be met with resistance because of what you believe. But to you, that is not something to be scared of. That is something to say, my hope is not in this world anyways. 
We sing, we've sung the song since we were little kids that this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Well, guess what? If you're just passing through, then chances are there's going to be some people along the way that are going to mock you, that are going to reject you, that are going to hurt you. And in that moment, rather than be terrified of what they have to say about you or what they can do to you, you need to step back and say, no, this is why I haven't placed my hope and my salvation in this world. This is why it's in God. And if you can step back and you can answer these questions and say, this is what my life says about the gospel. This is what others around me say. This is what my spirit is. This is what I'm thinking about. This is what I'm striving for. This is what I'm searching after. And I'm not scared of anything in this world. I'm simply scared and fearful of what I would do if I did not please the God who saved me then I believe that you can say that your life has been aligned with what matters, which leads us to our second thought, and the rest of these will fly through. Secondly, allow your suffering to be for Christ. Look at verse number 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. What? I, gotta, I have to experience hard times for Jesus? Most likely. What's the Bible say in, in 2 Timothy? Yea, all that shall live godly will suffer persecution. By the way, as I've already said, I think we're headed for more of that, not less. So he says, on the, in the behalf of Christ, it's not your job just to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. First of all, notice this, that Christ exemplified suffering. He says, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Jesus Christ suffered for you, so if you have to suffer for him, that's okay. Christ exemplified suffering. Secondly, we experience suffering. There will be suffering on this earth for the Christian. And just so you know, that's not just confined to Christianity. Suffering happens to everyone. Where it is important and different for Christians is this. Is that we know what suffering does in our hearts and lives. We have a context for suffering. Can you imagine going through cancer or going through death or going through whatever bad thing you can recognize in this world and not having the context of that Jesus Christ is building a place for you? Not having the, not having the concept of eternity figured out. Not knowing that you were going to see someone that you loved again. Can you imagine walking that road, going through that suffering, and not realizing the things that we believe? So we will experience suffering, but we have a different viewpoint of it. But then thirdly, Paul uses himself as an example of suffering. So Paul exemplified suffering. He says in verse number 30, he says, having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. So I want to remind you from lesson number one of a little bit of backstory to the book of Philippians, okay? Paul, we talk about the Philippian jailer in Acts. Paul was thrown in jail in Philippi, okay? So when he says having the same conflict in you that you saw in me, I think that what he's saying is some of you are going through the same persecution that I went through when I was there. He says you're experiencing a little bit of what I experienced. But it's okay because you're doing it for Jesus Christ. So I want to close with just a, with just a couple of applications. I know you've got a little spot there on your notes. I want you to think about something, okay? You will go through a lot of suffering in this life. You will go through a lot of difficult times. That's just the way life works. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. That's just humanity, okay? You will go through suffering at some point. But if Jesus Christ, if God ordained that suffering, I want you to listen to this. It could be that he is using it for his purpose. 
And sometimes there's suffering that we put ourselves through because of dumb mistakes and dumb decisions, don't we? That's, that's also part of life, unfortunately. That's probably the more frustrating part of life. But when that unexpected suffering comes into your life, when that unexpected trial comes into your life, it could be that Jesus Christ is using that for his honor and for his glory. And if you get bitter, if you get upset, if you turn your back against God and what he is trying to do in your heart and in your life, then I want you to see this. You will not have joy. You won't. You may be able to get put on a facade of joy. You may be you may become a part, you may stick it through church, you may not, you may fool everybody, but you will not have heavenly, personal, Christ-like joy if you cannot wrap your mind around suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. But the second thing that I want you to remember is that sometimes what you experience in suffering with others around you brings you closer than what you would have experienced if you had not suffered. If you can step back and say, okay, I'm walking a hard time, but look at who God has brought around me. Then God can take that and he can use it to unify you. He can use it to bring you closer. And suffering can actually be a source of joy and a source of unity rather than a thief of joy and unity. Because what's the first thing we do when we go through something hard? We push away from everyone, right? Well, I can't figure this out, so I'm just not going to talk to anybody about it. When the very thing and the very reason that God has placed us in a body, and when the very reason that God has put us collectively in a church and in a group and in a class is so that we have others alongside of us, we should see that as a source of joy and a source of unity rather than letting it steal that from us. Which leads us to the last thought, and that is this. Acknowledge your sacrifice for unity. Acknowledge your sacrifice for unity. As he begins verse number or chapter number two, he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the, of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. That sentence is continuing. He says, If these things are there, then fulfill my joy. But then I want you to look at verse number three. He says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Here's what he's saying, is that if you're going to have joy, if you're going to have unity as a Christian and as a group of Christians, then it will not be because everybody's searching for their own thing. It will be because everybody's searching for the same thing and they're forgetting about what they need and looking at what others need. I want you to go back to that practice that we did at the very beginning, that exercise about the most unjoyful times in your life, the most unpleasant times of your life, the times in your life that were the result of someone else causing you to lose your joy because of a loss of unity. Now I want you to think about it for just a second. How many of those things could have been avoided if someone would have been willing to sacrifice. I'm not even necessarily telling you that it was you. If someone would have sacrificially or selfishly, selflessly chosen, (laughs) selflessly chosen to do what God wanted them to do rather than what they wanted to do. And if you had to drill down on most of the lack of unity um, in churches amongst Christians, amongst friends, Christian families, whatever. If you had to drill down on it most of the time, I can't say 100% of the time, most of the time, it's because someone has lived selfishly rather than living selflessly. And let me just ask you, which one mirrors Jesus Christ best, selfishness or selflessness? Which one brings joy, selfishness or selflessness? You see, when we're asked the question, we know the right answer. But most of the time, it's not actually how we live our lives. 
So what do we need to acknowledge as we sacrifice for unity or as we sacrifice for even joy in our own lives or with those around us? First of all, see what, see what you have received because of Christ's sacrifice. I love verse number one because he goes through this list of very obvious things. He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, like you can almost give like an emphatic yes at the end of that, right? Like if there's any of those things in Christianity, then what do you do? You fulfill my joy. You do what you're supposed to do because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And there's people out there that want to cry about legalism in the Christian life. And by the way, there are things that you may not ever understand in Christianity. There's people that want to say, well, the commands of God don't matter because I live under grace. And by the way, technically you're right, but I think you've got a really warped view of the Bible. And here's what you need to see. That all of our excuses, all of our philosophies, all of the things that we might think or that maybe work out more logically in our ripe old age of 26, okay? All of those things are eliminated when you see what Jesus Christ has done for you. When you see that there's something bigger in this life and in this world than maybe what you want. And it could be that if Jesus Christ had as big of an impact on your life as what you say that he has, that it would be much easier to obey and follow him every single day. That it would be much more important for you to experience unity and to experience joy so that you could help someone else experience the same thing. So see what you have received because of Christ's sacrifice. Then secondly, see what your sacrifice fulfills in others. He says, fulfill ye my joy. He gets excited about this. He says, if this is what's present in the Christian life, then this is what you're going to do for me. You're going to fulfill my joy. How are you going to do that? He says in verse number uh, two, he says, having the same mind, or uh, being, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He says, see what is worthy of your sacrifice. See what is worthy of your sacrifice. So if we're going to fulfill, someone, fulfill joy in someone else's life and how we live, we must recognize what is worthy of our sacrifice. Here's the, here's the deal, okay? Most of the time we'll sacrifice because of someone else's gossip. Well, if that's what they think about them, then I don't like them either. We'll make a sacrifice because of what someone else said about someone else. We'll make financial sacrifices to get what we want, won't we? wow, I would really like to have this car or this house or this phone or whatever. We'll make a sacrifice for that. But when was the last time that you stepped back and you said, I have yet to sacrifice for something that matters. So what matters? What's worthy of your sacrifice? It's worthy to sacrifice a little bit of yourself for the same love, for the same bond, and for the same mind. Same love, same bond, he says in verse number two, having the, same, having the same love, being of one accord. You're bonded together and of one mind. But then notice the last two thoughts is that he also says, see what distracts from unity. See what distracts from unity. Verse number three, he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. You want to know what will distract from unity? is elevating your needs above someone else's. Doing something for your attention more than the attention of God. Unfortunately, we live in a world that we can do something good for God and still make it about us. Look what I did. Look what I did. That is strife and vainglory. When here's what Paul says. Paul says, think about someone else. And how do you do that? The last thing is see what develops unity. See what develops unity. It's found in verse number four. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Stop focusing on what you need and start focusing on what someone else needs. Now here's the deal. Okay, we'll close with this. 
unity doesn't always seem like something of importance. And in fact, I think that we've almost got a misconceived view of it. When we talk about unity, we all act like that it's going to be stand around a fire, hold hands, and sing kumbaya to still many other people, wiser people before me's illustration, okay? Well, unity means that we agree on everything. Unity means that we all look the same. And unity means that we all dress the same and talk the same and work the same. And unity means that we all like the same things. That's not Christian unity. In fact, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying Christian unity is being on the same page and of the same mind and of the same love and of the same spirit striving together in spite of those things. Here's the sad truth is that right now no one in this world agrees with anyone. Right? No one... In, no one in our church, we probably could not get 100% agreement in our church or in this room about everything that's going on right now in our society. There's some people that they will wear masks on their ears to keep from getting coronavirus. There's some people that wouldn't wear a mask if you put a gun to their head, okay? There's some people that they believe this about what's going on, and there's other people that, and by the way, that's in Christianity too. I'm not just talking about Fox News and CNN News, okay? I'm literally talking about in the body of Christ. And when he says Christian unity, he's not referring to, well, I believe that we should all wear masks because we're Christians. Like, you, you're not a ma hypocrite, heretic, send them to the fire, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's actually talking about being unified and of one accord in spite of what you believe. And here's what we've done, and here's what we've allowed Satan to do in the hearts and lives of Christians, is that we've allowed him to make us belligerent about what doesn't matter, and it has gotten us so off focus on what does. And we'll sit around and we'll debate and we'll argue and that we'll, we'll even divide over things that do not matter in light of eternity. We'll get mad at people that we spend, we are called to spend eternity with over something that this world says is important. Let that sink in. That we would not love someone or that we would get upset or at someone in this room or in this church because we didn't agree with their life or their decision about whatever. And when Paul makes a call for Christian unity that brings Christian joy, he's not saying, okay, if we're going to be unified, we all need to believe this. He's simply saying, if we're going to be unified, we need to be thinking about the same thing, and that is the gospel. If we're going to be unified, then we need to have the same thing flooding our soul and flooding our spirit, and that is the gospel. If we're going to be of one mind, then we're all going to make this not about us, we're going to make it about God. And you can get bent out of shape in this world pretty quickly. Just pull your cell phone out and check social media, and I guarantee you probably 50% of you can find something to be mad about within five minutes. But that's not why we're here. There's probably people in this room that you have not talked to or that you might be upset with or that you might feel like whatever. And if, you, if I pinned you down on it and said, is it because of selfishness? Is it because of a view that doesn't matter? Then guess what? You need to get rid of it. You need to get, get it out. So here's what we're con concluding with. Is that I can say a lot of stuff. I can give you points. I can give you fill in the blank notes. But here's the application. Who do you need to go talk to? To restore Christian unity and in turn restore Christian joy into your life. Who do you need to maybe go ask for forgiveness? Who do you need to go and, and say, hey, I heard this, and I just need to know if it's true? You say, that's uncomfortable. Yeah. But guess what? The gospel's worth it. Jesus Christ and Christian unity is worth it. 
And if we can't stay on the same page as Christians, why in this world, why in this world do we think that God is going to honor us with unity and with joy if we can't even figure out how to live in relationship and in connection and with fellowship with the people beside us that we're going to spend eternity with? You're going to go to heaven for all of eternity with some of the people that you're upset with. Let that sink in. If I'm God, I'm making some people go sit in the corner, okay? Like, welcome to heaven. You get to start off with your nose to the chalkboard, okay? I don't think he's going to do that because it's heaven, and we've all talked about, like, how good it's going to be. So I don't think he's going to start there. But if I was him, that's where I would start, right? And it just doesn't matter sometimes. It doesn't. It is a hard life to live to try to please everybody. When if we all were just focused on the same things, we would please God, and in turn, we would please those around us. So with every head bowed and every eye closed,